So Second Chronicles chapter 7. So the last chapter was the dedicatory prayer uh, from Solomon of the temple, thus kicking off the beginning of the first temple period of Jewish history. In this chapter, we're going to get the Lord's response back, basically, to this new temple. So if you think about it, this is technically not the first temple built. So we have the tabernacle of Moses that was built. There actually was a temple in the city of Zion in Enoch, pre-flood that was there. There was a place called the Cave of Treasures or a, more of a sacred place that the people went to worship with Adam and Eve's time. Not necessarily a temple. The, probably the first official temple is more the one that was in the city of Zion and of Enoch that uh, he built. And then there's the Tabernacle of Moses. Uh, traditionally, we think of the Tabernacle of Moses as the first, and then this is the first permanent temple built to God, is the, Tal the Solomon's Temple. So let's get uh, into this chapter here to get the Lord's response to this new temple being dedicated to him. Verse 1, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. So how would that be to have like fire from heaven come down and poof, hit the altar and burn, take up the sacrifices? Uh, the glory of the Lord filled the house. It was bright, uh, probably a cloud descending over it as well. In fact, verse two, the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. So amazing, not almost miraculous things that happen here. This is actually not an uncommon thing in temples. If you look at the history of LDS temples that are being dedicated, these types of stories happen quite a bit. There's great stories of angels coming and down and the glory of the Lord shown through the Nauvoo Temple and the Kirtland Temple in the early pioneer days. Um, the story of the St. George Temple, I believe it was St. George Temple that he was, one of the prophets was leaving. No, no, it wasn't the prophet that was leaving him. That was Manti Temple uh, that was the caretaker. I mean, back then they didn't have electricity, so things were powered by candlelight back then. And uh, when you were done with the temple, someone locked the doors and left. It was up to people in the area, leader, priesthood leadership in the area, to take care of the temple. We didn't have a whole other organization of the church, uh, you know, people that took care of the temple. Most of us today, we just show up to the temple. We go through the temple for the dead. We do those ordinances. Then we go home. We don't think about the maintenance of the temple, opening and closings of the temple, all the other things that have to be there for the temple to run. Uh, back then, they all had to share in that. That was just part of being a member, basically. Uh, there's a story, I believe it was the Manti Temple, as they were leaving. The guy was on horseback. Actually, maybe it was St. George. I might have to check into this and see. Or if you want, if you know that on this, sometimes you get these stories confused together because there's some cool stories. Um, they were leaving or going away from the temple. And all of a sudden, the area around them got really bright. So he's on his his wagon heading home. It's dark because they don't have cam, they don't have headlights, they don't have you know electricity, and all of a sudden the area around him gets really bright. He looks back and it looks like the temple's on fire, and he's worried that maybe a candle was still lit and it fell over and caught something on fire. We just dedicated the temple and it's now burning. He goes back and realizes that it's not the temple burning; it's glowing. The glory of God is on the temple and around it. There are, he heard choirs of angels inside singing, uh, really cool stories. There's tons of these stories from lots of different dedications all over the world. The St. Louis Temple had a similar one as well, where people, how the St. Louis Temple is positioned is kind of similar to what you get with the Washington DC Temple, where it's part of, it's right around that beltway area. So as you travel in one direction around the freeway in the town, you'll come across the temple. Well, there, the, when, after the St. Louis Temple was dedicated, there were several phone calls were brought in where people were complaining of a building on fire. So the fire department showed up a couple times to the entrance to the temple going, we were told there's a fire here. And they're like, nope, there's no fire here. But people were recognizing the glory of God, that light shining on the temple. So there's, there's lots of them. If you know some of the other stories, put them in the comments. We'd love to hear these stories. A lot of great ones worth looking into and understanding 
uh, from these dedications. So this is kind of similar to what's happening here in the first temple period. Now verse 4, Then the king, which is Solomon, and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. And so the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites were also with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry, and the priests sounded trumpets before them, and all Israel stood. Moreover, Solomon hallowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings. And the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar which Solomon had made, was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. So they, they kind of had to put some different things together to make this work, basically, uh, where they could do these, even though the ones that Solomon had made wasn't quite ready to receive these types of sacrifices, they may do. They got it to work. Now, verse 8, and at the, also at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, and a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. So this large area where all the people were living they had a huge seven-day feast where they were they were enjoying this uh, dedication uh, verse 9 and in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days and on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month he sent the people away into their tents glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the lord had shown unto david and to solomon to israel his people Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord, and in his own house he prospered, affected. He pro prosperously affected. So he was being inspired. Solomon was getting inspiration from God. He was putting the, the temple together, building the palace as well. He built some phenomenal buildings, basically. And uh, the, this is after the dedication of the temple. So the dedication, the temple's dedicated people are attending, they're doing their sacrifices, they're back on track after centuries of going away from God, of using idol worship and all kinds of other things going on. They're back to the real Mo law of Moses instructions of worship, basically. Verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive them their sin and will heal their land. Now this is important because this is exactly what uh, he talked about basically in the dedicatory prayer, he asked God to do this. So God's going, I heard the prayer. I will do this. I will follow this, which, which he's going to follow anyways, but it makes sense. Uh, verse 15, now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Again, that was part of the prayer that Solomon gave. God is now is confirming the things that, that Solomon asked of him in the dedicatory prayer. Uh, verse 16, for now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. And as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked and do according to all that I have commanded thee and shalt observe my statutes and my judgments, then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom according as I have covenanted with David thy father saying, there shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. So this is a this is reestablishing the promise given to David. Okay, he's saying David followed my commandments and he was established as a king and his lineage would be established as the kings of Israel. He's telling Solomon if you follow the commandments to yourself, you will be established and your line will be established. Verse 19, but if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, 
will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, which is high, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passeth by it, so that he shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? Now, so let's go back to this this, uh, warning basically given to Solomon. So he tells him again, if you keep my commandments, no problems, you'll be established. The kingdom will continue to run forward. All will work out for everybody. If you don't keep my commandments, then he says in verse 20, I'll pluck them up by the roots out of my land. Basically, he's going to remove Israel from the land. Just like if you're pulling weeds, he's getting them out of the soil. He's getting them off of it. They're going away, basically. And I'll cast them out of my sight. I'll move them all over my vineyard. Yeah, if you remember the, the parable of the vineyard in uh, the book of Jacob, in the book of Mormon, from, from the prophet Zenic, which is an Old Testament prophet, which we do not have his writings in the Old Testament. Although they have found uh, a Zenas or a, a, a similar name from Old Testament writings in the archaeological records that they have discovered, and so they think they found some of these, these writings, with the, and the allegory was a part of it as well. It's really cool. So he basically is warning Solomon about this. Okay, and we know from our perspective, thousands of years later, what happens. They go wicked and it goes really, really bad. Uh, and God does what he says he's going to do, basically. And he's, he's doing the other part of that promise now in the beginning of the gathering of Israel in right now. Uh, verse 22, it shall be answered because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he hath brought all this evil upon them. So realizing that even though you have this great house to the Lord, this amazing temple, the reason you are going to be destroyed and it's going to, the temple is going to go into disrepair is because of idol worship. Now, Israel was warned and warned and warned and warned and warned all the time, do not worship other idols. The law of Moses explicitly said it numerous times. They, they kept working on that. They fell on that one, and unfortunately, they're going to fall again with Solomon's children, in fact, unfortunately. So it's not going to take more than one generation for this to go bad for Israel, unfortunately. So let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue the story of Solomon.